thank you for joining us today at our Passport to 2044 event on key issues for elected officials and planning commissioners. I'm Maggie Moore. I'm a senior planner in our growth management group at PSRC. We're really excited to have you today. This is our 11th event in our Passport to 2044 series, but it's our first event specifically for elected officials and planning commissioners in our region. So we've had a number of deep dive events on different topic areas so far that we've had close to 1400 people attend in person. They're also all on our YouTube and we've had close to a thousand views on those. So these have been really popular events. We've had presentations from PSRC, Commerce, as well as MRSC. And then we've had a lot of your cities and counties and staff give presentations on the work that's happening at the local level too. And that's really been the most valuable part of these presentations so far. As I mentioned, they're all recorded and on our website. Today, we are going to be starting with some welcoming remarks. We're joined by Josh Brown, Executive Director at PSRC and King County Council Member Claudia Balducci, who is PSRC's president. We also uh, will be doing some presentations from Washington State Department of Commerce and PSRC on the role of planning at both the regional and the state level and what that means for your local comprehensive plans. We're also going to be sharing some key issues for local comprehensive plans, both from feedback from staff as well as you and things we've seen in developing Vision 2050 in the regional process. We'll then open it up for Q&A. And then we'll have a panel of elected officials to talk about their experience with local comprehensive plans and how they incorporate community visioning and feedback into local planning. So we are very excited about today's agenda. We have a lot to fit into 90 minutes, um, but you can always contact us afterwards if you have questions. The recording for today's meeting and all presentations will be shared after the meeting. Uh, so if you registered, you'll get an email with all of that content, but you can also find all of our presentations currently on our website, um, and they include many links in them too. So that's all available there. If you have a question today, you can ask it in the Q&A. So if it's a technical question, we can help out with that. But also we'll have that Q&A section later on, um, and so we may ask one of those questions for the whole group because it could benefit everyone. And then at the very end, You'll be prompted to take our Title VI survey, which just gives us an idea of the demographics of people attending today. So I'm going to turn it over to Josh Brown, the Executive Director at PSRC, for our formal introduction to today's event. Thanks, Maggie. I have to say our staff at PSRC, you saw the number of Passport series events we posted. It's going to be uh, you know, about a dozen uh, with, with, with today's session. They've done just an outstanding job. Uh, helping the region get prepared for this next round of conference of planning. And I love the poll questions, Maggie. I, 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 I you know, it was pretty interesting to me that about half of the, the audience so far haven't participated in a conference of plan update. Uh, my first conference of plan update, I mean, this is kind of like, you know, uh, uh, you know, some type of uh, counseling session or, or what have you, but it was back in 2006 and I wasn't staff here at PSRC yet. I hadn't yet been uh, elected or taken office as county commissioner, but I was a, a resident of Kitsap County and there was really important issues on how our, our community was planning for growth that really got me involved on the political side early on. So, um, you know, some of us have done this a few times, but, you know, I think the point of this series is a recognition that we need to get prepared together. And we came together as a region when we adopted Vision 2050 a couple of years ago. Uh, a couple of years ago, within Vision 2050, we really determined that there were some areas that we needed to up our game as a region so that growth could be done well in the Puget Sound region. Housing, equity, making sure that we are getting the most out of our transit investments throughout the region, whether it's light rail, fast ferries bus rapid transit or heavy rail, and of course, climate. Those were areas that we really focused on upping our game with Vision 2050, but adopting a regional plan, is just a plan. We have to implement it. And the way we do that in the state of Washington is through the conference of planning process and the steps that our membership at PSRC takes. So this is really our opportunity collectively to roll up our sleeves and, and make a difference. And I think we don't view our work at PSRC at our staff level as just 
adopting the plan and then seeing you in a few years. Really, the point of this Passport series is to work with our membership, work with our partners to get prepared together so that we're all rowing in the same direction and we're making a difference collectively. So with that, um, I uh, want to introduce and welcome King County Council Member and President of PSRC, Council Member Balducci. I know Council Member Balducci, you share a lot of my experience first starting off in land use on right. you know, the advocate, uh, resident, neighborhood level. Thank you so much for your leadership over the past few years as our president, and thank you for being here today to kick us off. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, on behalf of the board members and uh, electeds of PSRC, I want to welcome all of you, and we're very thrilled that you could join us today for this session. Uh, my name is Claudia Balducci, and uh, in addition to just, just finishing out my term as president of PSRC, um, I am a King County Council member and former mayor of the city of Bellevue. And um, I'm very happy that we're able to pull together this virtual event to talk about the importance of local comprehensive plans in central Puget Sound. Um, I want to stress we're all in this together. And what we do really, really matters. One of the, the stories I remember that first, first really brought home to me the difference that good planning could make is when I was speaking to former King County Executive Ron Sims, and he hearkened back to the uh, implementation of the first Growth Management Act, uh, the first comprehensive plans after the Growth Management Act. The Growth Management Act was visionary and set policy and gave us what I like to call regulatory encouragement. <laughs> but it's not none of these things are self-implementing. Planning is what connects the law and the adopted policies to actual experience on the ground. Uh, and it took a ton of hard work and negotiation and compromise, much of which happened among planners and local elected officials within the halls of Puget Sound Regional Council. Uh, and today you can see the urban growth boundary from a plane. It's a big green line and you, it, it, is, it is a thing that was created and preserved uh, because of good planning. Uh, but of course the job's never done because there no, there's no such thing as a complete or perfect plan. Reality is too complex. The world changes, needs and community values change. And of course, as Josh referenced, we're now faced with some very major challenges for our generation of planning. Uh, one of the things left undone for successful growth management is providing ample housing. Uh, a study that we did at King County determined that we needed 244,000 net new uni affordable units by 2040 in order to have a healthy housing market. In 2018, we set ourselves a five-year goal to have 44,000 of those units built. And today in 2023, we're just under 8% of the way to that goal. So when we take up planning this year, next year, in all of our jurisdictions around housing, um, there's a tremendous motivation to do more and to do better. Climate is another area where we will need to pay more attention because we're not meeting our goals currently. And then of course, uh, we have to emphasize equity because we know much more than we did in the last round of big comprehensive plan updates, the ways our planning hasn't worked for everyone, leading to displacement and a variety of racially disparate impacts. So we've got some big challenges and opportunities laid out ahead of us. Uh, future rooms full of people like this, Zoom rooms or in-person rooms are gonna look back and they'll see whatever green line it is that we start drawing here together now. Uh, what will that look like? How will our communities be improved? How will we improve access and opportunity for everyone? I'm really excited to see how that comes together, jurisdiction by jurisdiction working together. We all have a role to play and it won't always be easy, but it's a great time to begin working with planning staff in this effort. At PSRC, we're really proud and we look forward to working with all of you who will be part of this important work to achieve the ambitious, ambitious vision that the region has laid out for our future. And I wanna also say thank you to the amazing PSRC staff who are embracing this work and pulling together events like this to support all of us and all our member jurisdictions. You are amazing and we thank you. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Paul Ingram from PSRC to kick off the first presentation. I hope you have a great session, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Council Member. Really appreciate that introduction. I'm Paul Ingram, the Director of Growth Management at PSRC, and I'm going to give you just a lightning quick introduction to PSRC's role within the Conference of Plan update process. 
And I'm going to start with sharing my screen here. All right. Um, so I'm just going to dive right into a few quick things. First off, I want to recognize that updating a comprehensive plan is a lot of work. It involves your planning commission, a lot of public meetings, outreach activities, and of course, your city council process. Um, a lot of that uh, we can't take place of. Um, it, it, those are things where, you're, where you have to have those meetings and do them yourselves. But to the extent that we can, PSRC really wants to be there with you, support you, um, and provide as much assistance as we can. Maggie talked about the number of different webinars we've done. Um, we'll talk later about some of the other resources and tools. Um, we often think of uh, PSRC, the Central Puget Sound region, as a place where people come together to talk about those issues that don't stop at your city boundaries. Um, we know that where jobs are, the pressures on housing, um, these things cross over different city boundaries. And I, we love looking at pictures of Mount Rainier because we know Mount Rainier, the, the Puget Sound region stretches you know, from the Puget Sound, from the Kitsap Peninsula, all the way to Mount Rainier. It includes a wide variety of different communities and cities and, and types of land uses and, and activities throughout that region. And that there isn't the, just one way to plan for them. So we, we do have this regional framework um, Vision 2050 that Josh mentioned, uh, but we'll also recognition that each community is going to plan for things a little bit differently. Vision 2050 represents us working together as a region, um, not just one vision, but really a vision um, that encompasses that entire region. It, um, it looks at the environment and how to uh, improve water quality. We occasionally do uh, public surveys. And one of the things we consistently hear over time is that people are attracted to our region because of the quality of the natural environment. And Vision really talks about how to maintain that and sustain that um, throughout our region. Uh, it also sets out a template for how do we grow throughout the region, not just putting all the focus in downtown Seattle, but having a system of centers, of regional centers and town centers, local centers, places that are connected and that are our focal points for growth. Um, and um, it, it also provides the framework for how we deal with transportation. Here you can see a way under construction in Seattle, but there's a number of major regional projects and some not so major, but important transportation projects that are addressed in our regional transportation plan and having consistency with that um, allows us to plan for transportation in a coordinated manner. And of course, housing, as was mentioned, really some critical issues have come up in the last decade about housing, housing supply and affordability. Um, the Vision 2050 gives us that framework how we can all work in different ways, but how we can all work towards um, addressing the housing needs. And of course, other issues, but those are just a few. Vision 2050 and local conference of plans fit within this nested hierarchy of planning. Um, we have, oh, my arrows do not line up. I'm sorry about that. We have the Growth Management Act providing that regional, that, that framework at the state level about what needs to be, in, be included in each conference of plan. Um, PSRC is the regional entity that adopts Vision 2050 um, and has a role in reviewing and certifying both countywide planning policies and local plans. At your county level, uh, each county and its cities work together to adopt countywide planning policies as well as growth targets. And then there's your local conference of plans. I can't believe those arrows don't line up. <laughs> um, just touching base on your conference of plan. Many of you have been through this process. You know what's in your conference of plan. Some of you are new to it and getting familiar with your conference of plan. It's under the Growth Management Act. It has that 20 year look out to the future. Where is your community going to be? both from a growth standpoint and what's that going to look like? Where is that growth going to occur? How is it going to be served? Uh, it has elements on land use, housing, transportation, and potentially some other chapters. Um, and some of those are optional and some will come in the future. Um, state law just passed a requirement to have a climate element. That's not due until 2029, but might be something that you start to work on during this update. And you might think of your conference of plan as providing this kind of foundational piece, 
um, that supports your other city work. So by having your comprehensive plan policies, it supports what regulations you put into place, what zoning that you have that creates capacity for jobs and housing, what plans like your water system plan or sewer system plan, and the programs such as your capital improvement program, your transportation improvement program, perhaps parks or other programs that you have. Uh, what's really important is that there's consistency throughout these different aspects so that your growth targets are consistent with your policies and your zoning, and that in turn is consistent with the infrastructure and other services that you plan for the future. Uh, we have a range of resources. We'll talk about those more in a few minutes, and we have a lot of stuff on our website, as Maggie was saying. Um, I want to touch on, at the end of the process, uh, your comprehensive plan, it'll be submitted to the Puget Sound Regional Council, and our boards will review and certify that plan. We certify, we review, and look at the transportation-related components, which includes your transportation element and project list, but it also includes things that, like the targets, some aspects of housing and climate, and other things that also connect to uh, the transportation planning in your community. Certification is really important because certification is the first step to being eligible to apply for federal funding that comes through PSRC. We've, we, meaning you and us, uh, have all been doing lots of work with scoping, coordination. Right now, you're in the thick of your update. Um, our role is to provide technical assistance to the extent that we can to support your process. Um, as you develop a draft, we'll be looking forward to reviewing that draft and then working with you through that certification process. I'm going to hand it over to Dave Anderson from Commerce in just a second, but I, I thought it might be helpful to just think a little bit about the distinction because both Commerce and PSRC play very similar roles. We both want to support you, help you have a really successful comprehensive plan update process, but we're just a little bit different. So, of course, PSRC is looking really at how to advance the policy and vision 2050. Commerce is looking mostly at um, making sure that we're implementing the Growth Management Act. We both issue guidance. A lot of the times we work cooperatively and sometimes we refer to each other. Um, we both provide assistance. Commerce also provides planning grants um, to support your planning process. We don't. We both have checklist tools. Um, Commerce's checklist tools uh, can be used for the planning process, but can also be some part of its grant process. Um, ours is more about making sure that you, you come through the review and certification process. We both review plans and we really encourage um, being able to look at those plans early so that if there are any issues, we can identify them upfront and help you work on how to resolve them in a way that will be successful. And um, we like to give you comments prior to your planning commission uh, recommendation. So that again, so that any uh, issues, comments can be go back through your planning commission process and your commission has the opportunity to um, make potential adjustments as needed. We have a certification process. So as I said, once your plan's adopted, it comes through PSRC, it becomes certified, and that makes you eligible for federal funding for transportation projects. Commerce doesn't have a certification process, but they do look at plans, and um, plans need to be adopted in order to be in compliance with GMA. Um, as I said, we have a role with federal funding for transportation. Um, being, being in compliance with GMA has an effect with any state funding. So um, hopefully I didn't make that too simplified, but just wanted to kind of illustrate that there's a role of PSRC and there's a role with Commerce. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave Anderson from the Department of Commerce. Dave, and I will stop sharing. So thank you for uh, having me today. Uh, it's it's really a great uh, chance for us to get together, and I really appreciate the time uh, uh, for me to come and talk to you all about this. Um, at Commerce, and, uh, I'm 
trying to get my slide to advance. There we go. Okay. So at Commerce, we cover many of the same facets that local governments do. If you look at here, you'll see a whole bunch of programs that we have. And local governments are an essential implementation partner for all of these. So on, on behalf of the whole uh, department, I want to say thank you for being such valuable partners for us. We um, we have a lot of shared goals and we're delighted to be able to work with all of you and your communities uh, on all of our shared goals. So one of the first things I'm gonna talk about is I'm gonna talk about what, why we have plans and what actually makes a good plan. And I would propose that there are really three qualities that go into a good uh, planning document. The first one is that it's compelling. It, it must articulate a compelling sense of the community's long-term goals, and it must, but it must be flexible enough to, uh, for those goals to be managed adaptively. So you'll see things like a, a vision or goals and policies that you've adopted. These must articulate to the community a compelling vision of the future that's worth, um, that's worth striving for. The next thing it must have is a plan must be realistic. Uh, it must be grounded enough in reality that is achievable. If it's not, a community is either going to lose faith with the plan um, or come to regard it as something apart from and separate from its day-to-day -day decisions. Even worse, a community could make irreversible decisions on the basis of that plan that's really based only on wishful thinking. So when you see your comprehensive plan and you see things like forecasts and inventories and uh, analyses, these are about assuring that your plan is based on relevant facts and that your plan contains a realistic strategy to achieve your goals. And lastly, it has to be specific. It has to be specific enough that you can actually tell whether a particular action is working for or against the goal. If it's really nothing but a bunch of general words and policies, you can use it to justify just about anything and it's not really guiding your work. Really a good rule of thumb is that your plan should regularly force the community to face tough decisions uh, and deal with issues that they're uncomfortable with. If you have never made a tough decision to implement your plan in order to achieve a long-term goal, uh, you're not really planning. Um, so, so these are really, I think, the principles of a good plan. And if I had to, to sum up what a good planning document is in two words, it would be the two words you see there on the left. Disciplined imagination. It is imaginated enough to be a compelling vision of the future, but it's disciplined enough for you to determine how you're actually going to get there. So the planning process in Washington requires the periodic update process that we're uh, we're all in the middle of or starting, depending on where you are in the state right now. Um, local governments, when they're doing their update, they have to. Uh, oops. They have to address these things, okay? You must review your plan against amendments to the Growth Management Act that have occurred since your last update, whether or not you've met those. You have to uh, review not only your comprehensive plan, but also your development regulations. You will also be going through the process of resetting your growth target. Um, you'll get a new population allocation to address the next 20 years of your plan. You'll be reviewing your critical areas ordinance against it for any new science. And you'll also be um, in that process, you'll be looking at uh, the urban growth boundary through the uh, land, land capacity analysis process. And this is a this is a 10 year process. You'll go through this every 10 years, but you're not far, starting from scratch. So this is not a point where you have to throw the old plan out and completely rewrite it, but it is a point where you have to check in on the plan to determine whether the plan is really a feasible growth strategy for the next 20 years. So the decisions that are gonna be coming to you as you, uh, as an elected official are, are never decisions that exist in a vacuum. Th this is not one decision you'll be making. It is really a set of nested decisions. So we've already had conversations around countywide planning policies. You'll be going through the process of doing a growth target. This year it's new. It used to be you'd get a population growth target. This year, through the housing element process, you'll be getting housing unit production targets that are sub-aggregated by price point and housing type. So 
then you'll be doing your housing needs analysis, you'll be doing your land capacity analysis to determine whether any changes are going to be necessary in your strategy in your to or whether or not you have uh, you have a plan right now to accommodate um, your targets. Um, and then you'll be doing your growth strategy. How are we going to go about doing that if we need to make changes? And then you'll be looking at your capital facilities plan, your transportation plan, and the other pieces of your implementation strategy to determine whether the growth strategy you've established is one that is uh, financially realistic and, and otherwise something you can implement. So this is what the process looks like. And as you can see, these decisions build on past decisions and they build toward future decisions. So there's a couple of key points I'd like to leave you with when you're thinking about this overall process, okay? The first one is how critical it is that your community do good scoping up front. So um, we've, uh, you all have the checklist. You're, uh, you're in the middle of the process. One of the things we required as the first deliverable with our planning grants this year is to go ahead and complete that checklist so you've got a sense of what you're gonna do. Because when you're done with that checklist, you should have a pretty good sense of what your scope of work is. And we found from past updates that that's a really important part of keeping on track. So that's one. Another thing that's really important is when you're looking at your growth strategy, especially if you're looking at different alternatives, make sure all your alternatives add up to the same control total in terms of um, housing units and other demand, okay? Uh, you want to avoid a situation where your different alternatives accommodate different levels of capacity because you're actually not really learning a whole lot. You should be establishing your growth targets and then using your growth strategy to determine what are different ways of achieving that growth target. So that becomes the purpose and need for your SEPA work. Uh, and lastly, um, a really important practice is don't let your planning department do this entirely on their own in a silo. Make sure there is good regular communication between the planning department and your public works department and between the planning department and the other service providers that uh, your community relies on for infrastructure. So if you've got a water district or a sewer district or a fire district or even a school district, make sure you're in regular communication with them about what their plans are. Make sure they're working from the same, uh, the same set of numbers that you're working from in terms of what they're planning for uh, so that you can integrate the capital facilities part of the process with the land use part of the process. That's one of the foundational requirements in the GMA is that you're using, you're working your land use authority with your capital facilities authority and you're working those things in tandem. So uh, this is new this year. You're going to be getting, when you're doing your housing element and when you're doing your housing needs analysis, you're going to be getting your housing targets from a countywide process that has broken those down. And we've provided, um, we've provided housing targets based on um, the OFM median population for every county. And then there's a process the county is going through with the cities to break those down um, by, by income band and by housing type. And we've got some translators in, in our data to show you what that looks like in terms of different housing unit types. And that will form the basis for your housing needs analysis. That's new this year. Okay, we didn't have to do that before, but this extra level of analysis, I think is gonna be fundamental to assuring that we've actually got, uh, we've got a realistic strategy to accommodate our housing needs. So I mentioned before, you'll also be dealing with um, changes to the statute. Um, this slide shows some of the changes to the statute that have occurred before this session. Okay, and there's quite a few of those. And, I'm not gonna go into all of these, but here's some of those. And we've got that information on our website. One of the things we have on our laws and rules page is we've got a list of all the changes that have happened year over year, um, all the way back, uh, I think back about, I think about back about 10 or 20 years. So you can go back and look at those. You can look at when your last public plan was updated and get a pretty good sense of sort of what those changes are. There've been a lot of changes this year. Yesterday, I was talking to some, um, some folks from King County about uh, about some of these changes, uh, we'll be having a new um, we'll be having a new planner new uh, a new special edition of our planner newsletter that drills down in some of these, and we're in the process of producing FAQs and other resource documents to help you with this. Um, but there's been a lot of changes uh, this session again to 
um, it's a statute, so uh, keep an eye on those. Um, here's some more changes from this session. Uh, and lastly, grants. So um, this shows our grant formula. Uh, you'll, you're uh, you're going to be heading into the second year of your update grant. So you got the first half um, this past fiscal year. You'll be getting the second half starting July 1. Um, so these are, this is the baseline of the update grants. We're going to be um, the legislature's appropriated funding above and beyond this for continued climate planning, for implementation of the new, new middle housing and the new housing element requirements, um, more funding for some changes that were made to the Local Project Review Act and to help with permit processing. We've got some funding for voluntary actions related to uh, uh, improving the potential for salmon recovery. We don't have all our control totals yet. The governor just signed the budget, so we're still getting those from OFM. We'll have information about other grants on top uh, that will be available. So consider uh, the figures you have in front of you right now, consider those a, a baseline and it goes up from there and not down. Um, but we're uh, we're delighted to, con to work with you on those. And um, we're, we're very pleased that for, for this update, we, we have the opportunity to provide you some of the resources that you need to, uh, to do a good job with that. And with that, um, that's all I have. Hey, Dave. Uh, yeah. Before you stop sharing, I want to catch you real quick. Um, uh -huh. We're going to do Q&A in a few minutes, but I thought I'd uh, deal with one. And that's just a question came in. What's a personally planning jurisdiction? Could you go back to your map and okay, take that yeah. one question before we move on? Okay. Yeah. A partially planning jurisdiction is a jurisdiction that only has an obligation to designate resource lands and protect critical areas. So those are the ones in gray. Um, so different um, different parts of the state have different sets of obligations. The rural one has than the urban ones. Um, that's they're the smallest rural parts of the state. I'm sorry, it's not gray. I, I read that wrong. It's the, the counties in blue are the partial planning. Great. So I, or you, actually, it's the star. I just realized that it's the star that's partially planning. So Okanagan, Ferry, Lincoln, Adams, Grant, Whitman, Asoten. Grace Harbor, Wakayakum, Cowlitz, Skamania, and Click Attack. That's a, those are the partially planning. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Dave. All right. And with that, um, I think we will go on to Maggie Moore um, or Liz. I'm not sure which of you is going to start us off. And we'll come back and we'll do some more questions with Dave at, after uh, Maggie and Liz go. Fantastic, thank you. So as Paul mentioned, we'll, we'll do a Q&A after this presentation. This is our last PowerPoint of the day. Um, and then we'll move into our panel of elected officials. So I'm Maggie Moore. I'm joined by Liz underwood Boltman. We are both planners in the Growth Management Planning Group here at the Puget Sound Regional Council. And today we're going to be talking about big topics that we think are important for elected officials and planning commissioners as part of this update. We know that there are a lot of important issues happening at the local level. Um, we really see the six issues that we're going to cover today as a great starting place for conversations in your community as you're developing your plan. Uh, and we really want to recognize that your city and county staff are your local experts for a lot of these. So PSRC has many resources um, and guidance for local plan updates, but your city and council staff are on the ground, county staff are on the ground working on this, um, and they've been really involved in the PSRC process. So to really highlight uh, many of the issues at play, we asked you what you would like covered in today's event. Um, so this word cloud kind of represents the responses we got from people who registered for today's event. And the size of the word is how many times it appeared in that. So you can see that housing is a huge question. As Dave mentioned, there are changes in housing for your comprehensive plans, but we also know this is a big issue for our region. Transportation, climate, engagement, density, all big things that come up when we're talking about the local comprehensive plan update and when we're talking to constituents, community members in our region. We also know that this is what staff at your local jurisdictions are talking about and thinking about for, their, for the local plan update. 
We know that because we've been working with your local staff to prepare for the plan update process and the review. We have hosted 10 events so far before this one in our passport series. You'll see throughout this presentation in that gray bar, the stamps, the little passport stamps for the different topic areas we've had webinars on so far. And as I mentioned, these are all available on our YouTube if you wanted to kind of dive deeper into different topic areas. We're also planning for an event in June specific to new legislation and what that means for local comprehensive plans. So there's more to come. We're also meeting one-on-one -on -one with jurisdictions. So PSRC staff who will be reviewing plans are meeting with staff putting together those plans. And we've met with 70% of our jurisdictions so far. So 70% of the 86 cities and counties in our region to really talk about uh, where they're at in the local planning process, talk about plans for PSRC's review of those plans and helping us all to have certified plans. And in that, we're really talking about how PSRC wants to review drafts to kind of get ahead of any certification issues we might see. And through this, we know that local staff are doing a lot of work. Um, we've heard some great community engagement ha efforts happening, and we know that there are a lot of resources, both from PSRC and the Department of Commerce, for people to go through a lot of updates since the last plans were done. Um, so just a lot of work happening at the local level. So. In saying that, as I mentioned, we have six key topics we wanna to highlight today. Through these, we'll talk about the opportunities that exist for each, as well as questions. We think it would be great to ask yourself and ask your colleagues. Um, so other council members, other planning commissioners about how these are being addressed at your local jurisdiction. Uh, throughout the presentation, there are also links to many resources. You um, are able to go on our website and find the PDF of all of these presentations and see those links there. We also have a one pager that includes all of the links together and they're also found throughout PSRC's website. So the first key topic I wanna to talk about is community engagement. So I know that for the elected officials here today, you're, you work with your community members a lot. This is a big part of your role as an elected official. But we also know that traditional outreach methods don't reach everyone in our communities. And there are a lot of new models for community engagement that jurisdictions in our region are putting in play. So there are some great examples across the region. I heard of one city that is planning to do a carnival this summer where each booth in the carnival will be for a different element of the comprehensive plan. Uh, there's at least one city doing happy hour with a planner and a lot of great youth engagement work, both with elementary school up through high school and young adults, really recognizing that that's who will be adults in the year 2044, really helping them set the future uh, for your communities. So I will pass it over to Liz, who will um, talk about the other key topics. Great. Yeah, thank you. And so as part of that, your work on community engagement, um, there are a lot of different resources that are available from um, PSRC, as well as from other agencies about different techniques. Um, and it's great to ask sort of what kind of um, issues you should address through the process, um, who are you hearing from in your community, that type of thing. Um, so moving on to regional growth. Um, so we're anticipating as a region another 1.4 million people by the year 2050. So it's a little bit beyond the planning period uh, that you're addressing your, in your current plan. Um, but Vision 2050 really helps establish a framework for um, how and where the region should grow into the future um, and establishes different um, kind of expectations for growth for different types of communities in the region. Um, so through the countywide process, um, the, there's work that's already happened on 2040 for population, housing, and employment growth targets that were sort of set through the countywide process. Um, so you'll see as we kind of go through this, there are a lot of different issues that um, you might consider as part of your plan update, but um, this is one where there's already been a lot of work established in terms of um, how much growth you should be planning for as part of your plan. Next slide. Um, so one of the some of the key questions you might want to ask yourself is uh, where in your where do you want uh, growth uh, to be happen in your community and what should it look like? Um, and how is your community um, supporting growth in downtowns, other centers, uh, as well as areas well served by transit? Uh, and you definitely are welcome to look around at growth targets that have been adopted throughout the region, as well as guidance that we have about growth um, near transit. Next slide. 
Uh, I think we've already uh, mentioned uh, several times the uh, crisis of affordability. So in order to accommodate um, those 1.4 million more people, uh, we need another uh, about 800,000 housing units and our region is behind on housing production from the last decade. So um, an urgent need for more housing in general and more affordable units um, and housing requirements have really changed since the last comprehensive plan update. So it's a really an opportunity to um, look and think differently about um, how, how, how housing looks in your community. Um, and we do anticipate with new requirements that many communities will really need to look at new tools for affordability as well as um, capacity for more dense housing types. Next slide. Uh, so there are a lot of resources that have been developed about from housing from both the Department of Commerce as well as from PSRC, uh, including um, surveys of what tools local governments have adopted, um, other types of strategies that you could consider as part of your housing work. Uh, but some of the key questions, uh, the context of a local plan to think about is how much housing is needed for your community, um, especially to think about different levels of affordability. Um, what barriers exist today for developing more affordable housing? Uh, there are a lot of different factors that affect housing affordability. So um, trying to really understand um, the context of local tools, uh, local resources, what, uh, what else can be done um, through the, by local governments? Uh, and what tools um, has your community already adopted? Um, so zoning, other types of incentives, um, perhaps funding to a sub-regional housing group, those kinds of things, understand what, um, what tools you already have in place. Um, as well as understanding how your community envisions meeting um, the regional scale of housing needs into the future. Next slide. Uh, I think we've already hear, heard about the kind of question about racial inequities. Um, past and current housing practices in particular have, per, have perpetuated substantial inequities in wealth, home ownership, and opportunity. Uh, and people of color households tend to pay a greater share of their income on housing uh, than white households. You can see in the chart on the right here um, that shows disparities by race and home ownership, um, regardless of income for black and white households. Next slide. Uh, so there are a lot of different resources that PSRC has developed in terms of planning for housing, uh, and Commerce has also worked on developing resources around uh, racially disparate impacts and exclusion in housing. Um, so some of the questions to ask um, in your the context of your plan update are what are some of the displacement risks in your community? Um, there are some existing resources for that. Uh, what is your community doing to address disparities that exist today? Um, and has your jurisdiction committed to prioritizing equity and eliminating past harms? Next slide. Climate change, a lot of interest in climate change is part of the uh, kind of registration questions. Climate change is really an urgent environmental, economic equity threat that's going to require coordinated action from the local up to the uh, state, uh, national, global level. Uh, and the state, as well as the region, addresses um, includes substantial emission reduction goals for 2030 as well as for 2050. Um, so Vision 2050 already addresses climate change, but um, as Dave mentioned, there is new legislation that will require a standalone climate element by 2029. So there's some opportunities to consider the role of climate change as part of your current plan update. Next slide. So there are a lot of different resources that both Commerce and PSRC has developed in terms of understanding what some of the risks are, as well as what some of the policies that could help support um, reduced emissions. Um, but some of the questions to think about as part of your planning process are, what are the climate hazards that exist for your particular community? Um, what strategies is your jurisdiction using to reduce transportation-related emissions, which account for a significant portion of emissions in this region? Um, and do you have an existing climate element as part of your comprehensive plan? And should that, is that something you'd like to look at for the 2024 update? Next slide. Uh, finally, looking at transit investments, uh, the region is making uh, significant investments uh, in particularly in high capacity transit. Uh, and Vision 2050 includes ambitious goals for growth around transit, which is really reflected as part of um, the growth targets that um, an individual jurisdictions are planning for. Uh, but we really anticipate that all communities should be planning for transit. Uh, I know some are outside of plant transit districts or don't have the frequency that they'd like today, but this is really an opportunity to sort of help plan for for um, future growth and transit and kind of set yourself up for uh, the next level of investment. Next slide. Um, so we have a number of different resources on transportation planning in general and kind of what, um, how we can support your plan updates, but questions you might think about as part of this plan update is what would you like transit to look like in part as you're in your community? 
Uh, what types of multimodal investments are you making to help support transit, walking, and biking? That connects back to our climate work too. Um, and how are you working with transit agencies and other partners as part of that? Next slide. So really, we see the 2024 updates as a big opportunity that um, not all planning commissions, not all council get to get to take up, but uh, to really help address and make a contribution to these issues. Um, the region is growing and changing, and we certainly all have a role to play in addressing some of those around our shared global, uh, goals around climate change, as well as um, our addressing the need to address more affordable housing uh, and really leverage and take advantage of those investments in transit. So really see a lot of great opportunities here as part of this update, and hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that as part of the panel. All right, thank you, Liz, such a nice presentation. We're gonna take just a few minutes for some of the questions that have come up. And like you said, Liz, I, I really like that image that we ended with, um, kind of the art thing there, but also the idea of if you work for a city, you really get this opportunity to think long-term, think about these policies once in a decade. So rather than thinking about this like huge overwhelming work that we have to do, like kind of think of it as like, hey, this is once in a decade that we really get to think about the future. It's, it's really awesome. I have a question, um, Dave, for you, uh, kind of a straightforward one. Uh, where, will there be climate grants um, in the coming year? So I think you know both an answer and maybe some speculation about the future. Uh, short answer is yes, there will be climate grants. Um, still working out the details of, uh, because the Puget Sound's implementation timeline is out in 2029, um, where uh, uh, some of that money would be for voluntary early action perhaps. Um, our first, uh, the first, uh, first priority is going to be the jurisdictions that have an obligation in the next two years, so we can start funding those. And um, but if uh, I think we, I think we'll be able to provide some voluntary uh, um, grants for jurisdictions who want to get started early as well. Yeah, great. It's really nice that um, there's a number of grant programs, climate as well as the planning grants, housing grants that are available out there. Um, a question that came in that I think was kind of answered during the presentations, but let's go over it again. So in uh, in the new House Bill 1181, we have a requirement for a climate element, climate and resilience element that's due for this region in 2029. Um, Liz and or Dave, maybe you can both answer this. Um, so does that mean cities really need to do it now because this is the update period? Um, or is there a partial update process that will be used? Um, Dave, you want to start? I would think of it as kind of a mini update at the 2029 mark. Now, you may look at the requirements and realize, especially if you've done a lot of climate action planning already, you might find you're most of the way there and you can take care of it in this update cycle. Um, that's the that's possibility. Um, or it may be that you want to get your, you, you think you're most of the way there um, and you want to take care of some of the, um, some of the fine tuning at the 20, at the 2029 period. So um, it's possible you can start early, but your, uh, your deadline's in 2029. So think of that as kind of a mini update. Um, there's also a bit of a deadline extension on the housing uh, development regulation requirements in uh, House Bill 1110. Those are due six months after your periodic update is due. So um, you'll kind of have a year, and and you all you already get an extra year effectively to implement the update to your critical areas ordinance. So you can sort of think of it as your periodic update. A year later, you've got the periodic update hangover. Um, some jurors, some counties have done what's called target reconciliation in the following year after everyone's got their plans done. Um, and then another uh, five years later, you'll be doing what's called your implementation progress report, and then you'll have your, uh, that'll be the due date for your climate element. Yeah, great. And Liz, do you want to say anything about 2029? We also kind of do a general review. We, we I should say, we do a update division about every 10 years, but we also kind of do a mini review in five years, or we're anticipating that. Liz, do you want to say anything about kind of that 2029 process? 
Um, yeah, I think we're really looking forward to working with local governments on uh, the updates to the climate element, as well as other updates that are required as part of that bill to the transportation element. So I think that's another kind of opportunity to sort of check in and refresh. I think just going back to the question about you know what should happen in your 24 update, um, in the central Puget Sound, uh, both Vision 2050 as well as the countywide planning policies talk about um, emission reduction and addressing climate change, but the state bill includes more specific requirements and more kind of complete set of requirements around um, uh, emission reduction and mitigation. So um, I think there's some work that you, you can definitely do as part of this update um, that can help set you up for the work that's gonna happen in 2029. Yeah, great, thanks Liz. Um, let's just try, try to make sure I can check on some of these uh, different questions. One, Dave, this might be something that, that you can respond to over the course of the thing, but, um, Emily Artesh, um, a great planning director in our region, she recognized you shared some legislative changes slides last night at a mm -hmm. King County meeting. She wonders if you could post those or share those. So if you can find a way to do that, um, or we can follow up um, later to make sure that people have access to those, that, that would be great. Yeah, we, we can sure do that. We will also be doing a special edition of our planner newsletter that will basically be a written version of the presentation last night and as soon as that's up we can share that with you and that'll if you're on our uh, if you're on our distribution list for the planner newsletter you'll be getting that and that'll be on our website as well so that'll be another good resource where we sort of run all those down and i i've recognized both we commerce and i've seen a number of other agencies be doing some kind of recaps of the legislative session so there's a lot of good information out there um, Liz, there's a, a few different questions about setting targets, how they're set, uh, minimums and maximums. We hear these questions a number of times. Could you, now talking about what targets are could be a long discussion, but could you try to give a quick answer about what targets are? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll do the best I can quickly. Um, so growth targets are really the, the amount of growth, of, of the, your share of the region's forecasted growth that you should be planning for is in the next 20 years. So in terms of understanding kind of what types of investments you need to make in your transportation system, um, that's and uh, understand how many people you might expect in the future, that's really the number you should be looking at as part of your 2024 update. Um, and so there's a framework as part of Vision 2050 about kind of like dividing up that growth between different types of jurisdictions. So big cities, smaller cities, cities that have high capacity transit. And then at the county level, um, there has been work over the last few years to um, help divide up that growth among different cities and unincorporated areas. And those that process is really also considered other factors of, sort of how much growth has happened in the past. Uh, what's the capacity for growth? What are the plans for those communities into the future? So uh, it's that county wide process that can really sort of take into account like all the different variables that you might want to consider in terms of how much growth that you should be planning for. So there's a regional framework, but also kind of uh, buttressed by other data from a countywide process to help inform that that uh, target. Great. Thanks, Liz. And we'd be glad to follow up with any of you individually about what do you have in your countywide planning policies? What targets have been set? Um, most of those have already happened. Some of the counties are still going through some adjustments to them. Um, Liz, while we've got you, a uh, great question here. Thank you for asking this so we can highlight it. Can you share a little bit about the review of centers? Um, the questioner says they think it's still a surprise that most jurisdictions um, have to look at their centers because they're really focused on their comprehensive plan right now. Yeah, so also kind of uh, hopefully it won't be too long winded, but um, as part of our work a few years ago, we updated our expectations for regional growth centers. And so um, part of that work is sort of has a long tail in terms of implementation. So we have designated regional centers around uh, the region and those places need to plan for um, have, have a, basically a center plan that helps describe those areas in more detail. Um, so we are um, we have a deadline in 2025 to take another look at those center plans. And so the 24 updates are really a good opportunity to take a fresh look at those center plans and um, and understand kind of like where they're fitting into your community overall. So um, that's that's part of our regional centers process. Not every jurisdiction in our region has a regional center. So um, hopefully, you know, if you do, um, and we can definitely share the map if people have questions about that. Um, but that's um, it's something we're looking forward to as part of our centers uh, monitoring work to make sure all those jurisdictions are um, kind of 
participating and uh, in sort of meeting the, those expectations. Great, thanks, Liz. Um, I'm going to repeat what Dave said a minute ago to respond to Nicole's question. Um, the due date under House Bill 1110, and Dave, if I remember, remember right, also 1337, the ADU bill, um, is six months after the comp plan deadline. So it's not December or January, but it's June of the following year. Yep, it'll be June of 25 for y'all. Yeah. Um, we have a question about electrification of fire and police and how that might affect service. Um, I don't have a study on hand that I could point to that, that is that specific. Um, we are participating in the Puget Sound Climate Preparedness Collaborative, um, and I think also an electrification collaborative. So I'm going to try to find the websites that might deal with some of those electrification questions, and I'll try to put that in a response to that question. Um, we're one minute over our Q&A for this time period. Um, if you have questions, you can put some in. We can try to maybe answer a couple live. And then um, we'll also try to, if we have time at the end, we might be able to come back to them. And we'll also be able to look forward to continuing the conversation with you um, individually, directly. Please reach out to us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, let me see here. I'm turning it over to Ben. Ben, you're our moderator for the next part. I am, Paul. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Ben Bacenta, Director of Regional Planning at PSRC. And I'm lucky enough to end out um, our event today with a panel of elected officials from around the region who um, are giving up their valuable time, to, valuable time to join us. And so if you all could turn on your cameras so that folks can see you and we can do some quick introductions. I know that some have some time constraints, but we are joined by uh, Mayor um, Kim Roscoe of Fife, uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Pro Tem, uh, Brian Wall from Mount Lake Terrace, uh, Councilmember Teresa Mosqueda from the city of Seattle and Councilmember Ed Prince from Renton. So thank you all. It's a great distribution around the region and different types of jurisdictions. And so um, really excited to hear your perspectives on this comp plan um, update process. So we have a few questions and I know that um, Councilmember Mosqueda has, has a time constraint. And so we'll start with her um, if, we, if we can. Um, so first off, um, if you could, um, let the folks know what planning issues most motivate you and, and what you do, what do you think makes a good plan? Uh, thanks so much for having the opportunity to be here again. Um, it's great to see many familiar faces and I appreciate um, all of the work that you're doing. I'm going from here to Board of Health and I think it's all connected actually. This uh, comp plan process is all about health. So the question about like what motivates me, um, it, this is really about good planning to promote health. When we do comprehensive planning that thinks about how we integrate not just housing, but social cohesion, community gathering spaces, opportunities for people to walk and walk near uh, trees and green space and streams and integrate that into what our planning of the future looks like, it promotes health. It promotes social cohesion. It improves the social determinants of health. So I uh, get really nerdy about the comp plan process because it really does go back to improving population health. I'm also excited about the opportunity to be part of this discussion because it's really forward thinking. I'm like saving all of the presentations that were shared uh, this afternoon because this is about how we create a blueprint for healthy growth in our communities. And I think a good plan, a good comprehensive plan allows for us to do what many of the speakers talked about correct past wrongs, address past discriminatory policies that are still prevalent in our planning and zoning laws today. And it is pretty shocking. It's jaw, it's jaw dropping and it should be a call for action when we overlay redlining policies of the past with our current zoning policies that are in statute. And you can see where that overlay continues to perpetuate itself. That was done through the pen that crafted public policy then. And we have the power to use the pen now to correct those past historic wrongs. It makes me excited to think about doing that as we also address the most pressing crisis on our planet today, which is climate change and global warming. We can do this by making sure that people have greater access to housing, yes, but also creating access to greater housing security and 
integrate that into what our community needs for a healthy economy. So building housing as we also build small business spaces and childcare spaces, investments in green space and proximity to um, open space. That's, I think, um, what really motivates me. And to also know that we don't have to do this alone, right? We can integrate this concept with existing policies. Well, specifically in the city of Seattle, integrate it with the Jumpstart Progressive Payroll Tax, which quadrupled our investment in affordable housing. We have our housing levy that we're currently considering right now that is contemplating how we can build more. But when we do it in conjunction with the comp plan, it means we're doing it right, not just more, but doing it right. So that those are some of the things that excites me, uh, integrating the comp plan into our proposals for more affordable housing, green new deal investments to address um, the, the, the growing need for cooling centers and community centers, warming centers, and also to address um, equitable development, increasing access to economic opportunity as we also create, increase access to housing affordability. Thank you, council member. And as one follow-up and to allow you to um, go to that next meeting at the Board of Health that you, that you mentioned, um, just curious if there's something you've been hearing from community members that's been unexpected or surprising to you. Um, that might be addressed through a comprehensive planning process. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I always uh, love to share the story about when I did a walking tour with the Chamber of Commerce out here in West Seattle. And I stopped by a small restaurant um, who the business owner took a lot of time to meet with me. And I asked him if I had one thing that I could do, if I had a magic wand today, what would you like? And he looked at the empty parking lot across the street up on California Avenue. And he said, if that was not a parking lot, and if instead that was housing with childcare on the first floor, then workers here would not be so stressed out about whether or not they were going to make it home in time to pick up their kiddos. They'd be able to walk to work, to spend more time with their family, and I'd have more access to workers who were able to get to, to and from work, then also be able to spend time with their family. He's like, workers right now don't have access to affordable housing. And that's hurting me as a small business. And I love to share that story because I think it resonates with the conversations that I've had with folks on Vashon Island and in Burien and, and know that that's experience on the East side too. Many of our small businesses are also being harmed by the lack of access to affordable housing, or if we want to call it workforce housing, just housing in general. And that is actually um, a detriment to our efforts to have a more healthy equitable rebound after COVID. So I think that there's a lot of common ground in what we're trying to accomplish as public policymakers. We have to address that 1.4, was it million people that are coming to our region by 2020, 2050? Um, we have to address it because we know people are going to continue to come here, either as workers looking for good living wage jobs, as entrepreneurs who are coming, or people who are coming here because of extreme weather in other parts of the country or the globe. This is going to be a more stable place to be. Those numbers show that we need to plan for it. And as we use our comprehensive plan, we can actually have discussions about how we create the both and approach, both building tree, building housing as we plant more trees, creating opportunities for housing to be coupled next to child care and small business supports and, and community gathering space. And I think it's also an opportunity for us to answer the question that one of the panelists said, which is think about where you want growth to occur in your local jurisdictions. Where I want growth to occur is up. I don't want us to continue to encroach into forest lands and farmlands and wetlands. And I know that as a region, we're always concerned about the edges of our growth management plan. If we can grow up and create denser opportunity to utilize more of the space around our region, and also couple that with green space um, and, and open space. That is the backyards of, of the future, right? I live in a townhouse in um, a place that is now my first opportunity to own a home. And because we were able to build up and create four units on one spot, I was able to ultimately buy this place. But my backyard is pretty small. It's about four by eight. Don't tell my husband who loves to do yard work out there, but I'm pretty sure we have more yard tools per square footage than anybody else. But our yard is very small. And that's okay. 
because I live next to Delbridge Park and Longfellow Creek and can go to, you know, the um, Dragonfly Park around the corner. Those are the backyards of the future. So we can use our comprehensive plans to allow for us to build up denser, more affordable and diverse housing next to green space and community gathering space. And it makes me really excited that we have the opportunity to do that in partnership with community. So we've been planning in Seattle, putting funding in for community led engagement strategies wanting to make sure that we had more authentic conversations about who was sitting at the table and really reminding people, you know, even in areas that were previous called, previously called single family zones in Seattle, they're now called neighborhood residential. So we can remember what the fabric of our neighborhood um, is actually. Uh, it is small businesses often integrated into our neighborhoods. It's the opportunities for two and three and four units to be under one roof. That used to be more permitted in the past and we've downzoned historically over the last five or six decades. Now is an opportunity for us to remember that the fabric of our neighborhood still incorporates many of those small businesses and quads and triplexes. And that should be um, seen and celebrated as we think about how we can create greater density and green space at the same time. Thank you, council member. Those are all great things to keep in mind as we all move forward. Um, with that, Mayor, Mayor Roscoe, I uh, want to give you an opportunity to um, identify, you know, what do you think makes a good plan and what um, planning issues motivate you? Thank you, Ben, and thank you everyone else that's uh, here today in this important conversation. I would say that a good plan is clear, has internal consistency, but also allows for flexibility. Um, we also need to understand and prepare for external impacts. Fife is about six square miles. We have I-5 running through us. We're going to have 167 running through us. We're wholly located on the Puyallup Tribe of Indians Reservation. Um, so we really, if, if we want to continue to represent and create a space for businesses and our residents, we need to be planning. We need to continue this process that has been going on and take an opportunity to make the adjustments that uh, you know we need to right the wrongs of the past. Um, some of the focuses that I think Fife really wants to put into the plan moving forward is around the affordable housing element. We have so many residents that are in our apartment complexes and they're no longer able to stay. They have to move farther away from their jobs just to stay housed. Um, as I mentioned, we, are, are, we have a lot of impacts from the region. We're at the doorstep to the Port of Tacoma. Um, so, if we're not planning, then the county and the jurisdictions around us are planning for us. Um, and then for the Puyallup Tribe of Indians and that relationship, they are developing a comprehensive plan. They are, um, we're seeing more development on trust properties. We look forward to collaborating and coordinating and understanding how their growth is going to um, impact and be integrated with our growth and vice versa. One of the biggest things I've heard for the last 20 years on council is traffic and congestion. Um, I'm happy to be on the Sound Transit Board of Directors with council member Ed Prince. That's gonna be a huge change for the city of Fife. Uh, we have tried in the past to get more public transit through Pierce Transit, um, but we don't have the ridership yet to, to keep these, you know, bus lines coming through. But with this growth and opportunity that the Sound Transit Station is going to bring, we need to be in front of that now so that um, we can be ready and in control to a certain aspect of what develops around that transit station and that we're creating opportunities for people to live in Fife and have access to the region um, through this development that's occurring. 
Thank you. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned interjurisdictional inter coordination. That's one of the cornerstones of the Growth Management Act and recognizing that um, these issues extend across your jurisdiction and that your jurisdictions and your communities, your neighborhoods are impacted by the actions of other people. And so you need to be working with them. Um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, well, same question for you in terms of what planning issues most motivate you and um, what do you think makes a good plan? Well, the, what motivates me is the opportunity to really shape what my city is going to look like in 20 years. I mean, this is a huge opportunity for us where, you know, it's say once every 10 years. So this is, this, this is an opportunity to take advantage of how your city is going to look or your community is going to look in the future. Um, for me, uh, a robust economic development element is going to be key. Uh, primarily because we're a small city with big dreams and we've got to pay for it, right? We've got to be able to come up with the revenues to be able to pay for the services that we want to provide to our city. And, uh, but it's also about providing job opportunities and, and access to the goods and services we want to provide for our citizens. Um, another key piece is housing. You know, we, we're all talking about housing and, and it's critical that we provide a variety of, of choices that are affordable to all income levels. Uh, it's also important for us to, uh, when you look at the economic development perspective, it's about rooftops, right? I and mean, we've got to have enough how housing to attract the kind of economic growth we want to see in our community. Uh, and we've done a lot of a lot of work around around housing over the last number of years. But it's time to take another look and, and make adjustments. I mean, we, we've adopted ADUs, we've adopted cottage housing, we've adopted you know, a number of different things, but some of those strategies are working better than others. And, and we need to figure out why some of those strategies aren't working and what kind of adjustments need to be made for us to be able to ensure more affordability and, and a greater variety of housing choices. Another key, of course, is in, uh, ensuring the infrastructure is in place uh, to accommodate that growth. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not a priority for people. Uh, infrastructure is not a priority for people until it fails. And we want to make sure that it doesn't fail. We don't want it to be a priority for the people because we need to be, be sure that we've got, uh, got the infrastructure in place. Um, and, and, you know, what makes a good plan is, you know, this is what a plan that is achievable, that is, uh, has specific ideas and, and strategies for how you're gonna achieve this growth. And this is what's gonna guide your future decisions on public policy, land use decisions, budgets and allocating resources, capital projects. Um, and I, I guess, you know, a lot of that work is, is, has been pointed out. A lot of that work has been done as far as the data analysis and, and the staff is gonna take care of a lot of that. And it's been, the county is, uh, and, and the partners are have already allocated the number of uh, housing units, the population growth and the number of housing units and all of that. So it's our work to be able to figure out how to make that all work in each of our communities. And I, I guess the key for us as elected officials is really to look at the goals and policies, the action steps and performance measures. Those are going to provide the framework for how we're going to, how our community is going to grow. And, and, and this is an opportunity for you to address the priorities you want to achieve in your in each element in each chapter uh, for instance if you if you if your city or community has adopted city goals uh, you know each year we go through and, and update our, our city goals right incorporate that into your your comprehensive plan and then make sure that that is implemented through your budgets and through your uh, capital projects um, and, and and it's it's important to also look at those action steps in your comprehensive plan it, behind each element. Those action steps inform, uh, you know, which specific actions you're gonna be taking to achieve the growth uh, and the goals that you want your community. And then finally, performance measures. Uh, have key performance measures in place to track how your community is doing and achieving the goals you want to achieve. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Um, Councilmember Prince, anything to add on um, what you think makes a good plan or, or the planning issues that motivate you? Uh, thank you, Ben. So, uh, so much of what I've thought about has been said, but I will, I will say this. I think at the root of a good plan is community involvement and community buy-in. And if you don't have community involvement and community buy-in, uh, then you're really going to struggle. Um, I think 
transit oriented development is really important. I think that's one of the things that we need to look at. Um, as Mayor Pro Tem Wall said, economic development, housing, all different types of housing. Um, and the thing that I'm hearing about the most now is what are we going to do for climate? And the reason why I'm motivated and passionate about the comprehensive plan is because as an elected official, so much of what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis is in the now. It's issues that are thrown in front of you that need to be solved for the now. Uh, the comp plan process is really, what do you want your city to look like in the future? And how do you plan for that future? And how do you make that future look better? Absolutely. So Mayor Roscoe, I'm just curious, um, have you been hearing anything that has surprised you um, from your community? Anything unexpected? Um, you know, just to um, Council Member Prince's point, I um, we've had a series of neighborhood meetings where we're kind of geographically identifying similar areas throughout the city. Um, they're not like typical neighborhoods that you would see. It was just a way to, to kind of split up the city to reach everyone. And to his point, I was surprised at how some of the urgent issues that we're dealing with around homelessness and crime were really at top of mind for folks. Um, so it was in it was surprising and a little bit challenging to to work through some of those comments and bring out of folks the look towards their future. Um, other than that, honestly, not, you know, folks still, they want, they want to be able to drive and get places. They want to feel safe and they want to understand what the future of the city looks like. So then we loop it around and say, well, you know, that's what we're doing here is, is creating these plans. Um, not super surprising, but an opportunity was to help folks understand the different levels. You know, that hexagon slide that we were looking at earlier that shows how at a city level, how many other plans are being worked into our element, how many other plans affect what we can and cannot plan for. Um, so I think, yeah, not, not huge surprises, but such urgent issues right now that I haven't seen really in the past plans I've been, I've worked through, which I guess really is only once. Yeah, it's true that the sense of urgency does seem heightened. I've been in this planning business for for a couple of decades now, and it does seem different this go around. So um, those, that's a great observation. Mayor Pro Tem Wall, uh, are you hearing anything surprising to you or unexpected from your community? You know, I, it, it's still early in the process, and and you know, people haven't really engaged in uh, the, the update at this point, and 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 I I don't think that they will until. We really, A, we start a robust public engagement process and program and do the outreach and, and involve the stakeholders and interest groups and get them involved. And, and by the way, one of the, one of the things I really encourage each of us to do is, you know, if you have a diversity, equity and inclusion commission or board, include them in this process. Make sure that they have their, their eye on the, the update and the plans and the goals and the vision that you have for your community and are able to have some input. Um, and, and, you know, but the, the pushback isn't going to come until they start to see where that density is going to go and where that affordable housing projects or whatever, how we're going to accommodate that growth. Um, but one thing that surprised me, and it's not, it was a survey that, that you all did for the region and state uh, and, and how housing is the number one issue now in our communities. And 82% of the public expect government to address uh, the needs for housing and and 66 percent support uh diverse choices in housing and so hopefully that that will relate to as we start rolling out our plans for addressing uh housing for all economic segments and and having to increase our densities in throughout our cities um hopefully those those results will translate into support for 
uh, what we need to do and how we're going to grow. Absolutely. You know, one thing that strikes me with the composition of this panel is all of your jur jurisdictions are the future of your of the your cities and your communities are really centrally tied to sound transit in many ways in those investments in bus rapid transit in light rail in commuter rail and um, uh, and and we know that those are those are difficult projects to implement and construct they're expensive and they take a long time um, but uh, maybe you could. Do you have the sense that your communities are just eagerly awaiting those 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 services to kick, kick into gear? Um, and do they do you think they see the op the growth opportunities that is associated with that infrastructure? And any that's open to anyone. Absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Councilmember Prince. I was going to say exactly what Mayor Pro Tem Wall said. Absolutely. I mean, it is probably. The question I get asked the most when I'm out in the community um, is about sound transit, the investments, when they're coming, the impact that they're going to have on the community. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, and and I mean we're, we're we're we as a community are very excited and anxious for uh, de delivery to start. Um, and, and those trains start running. Um, but one of the things that another thing that kind of surprised me is you know considering that sound transit is going to have a, a station in mount lake terrace uh we really we updated our town center plan um and we went through an extensive process and and, and engaged the public and the stakeholders but you know we we were increasing densities uh, tremendously in our town center area and we had widespread support for doing that and no pushback uh, in, in increasing the densities in our town center area. So uh, I, I think there is a, a changing mindset out there as far as embracing change, embracing diverse housing types, embracing denser housing, uh, at least in, in, in the transit corridor areas that I think we all live in, yeah. uh, we're seeing a lot of support for for the density that we, we know is coming. And, and, and you know, you look at the, the the new generations and and their lifestyle and what they're how they're living what they're what they're looking for what they want in their housing choices is is different than what we've had in the past they aren't looking for those big backyards uh they're looking for the amenities that come with uh with the big you know big bigger cities and and the entertainment options and uh, uh the ability to get to where their jobs and to to, to services and to enjoy the environment. So I, I think we're seeing a, a changing of the guard in, in many ways. Um, that's not to say that we won't face pushback from, from some residents as we're moving forward. Um, but I, my recommendation for, for you there is enlist their support. I mean, growth is coming. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of how are we going to address this challenge, right? How, and, and so if they're saying no, 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 then bring them in into the process and ask them, okay, how are we gonna do this? What, what do you recommend? How do you think we need to uh, provide the housing that we're required to provide in our communities? Absolutely. I, I also have seen that real shift over the last dozen years in particular, I think, to uh, much more widespread acceptance of transit oriented development now that people can see it and see what it looks like it's not as abstract as it perhaps was in the past um, mayor roscoe any other thoughts on that we're getting close to the end of our time but we'd like to give you an opportunity to reflect on that question yeah, no i would uh really just echo what uh mayor pro tem wall indicated around the acceptance of the transit oriented development that is going to be a, a new type of housing for fife uh, we did get a county designation a while back for a center of local improvement um, importance, and um, we are going to focus the, the planning guidelines and our investment into that city center. We had, even before that center of local importance, kind of decided that we needed a city center on the north side of I-5, on the north side of our city. Um, we kind of have that on the south side around our city hall. So yeah, just recognizing that this change is coming 
Um, that is, I guess, also pleasantly surprising that people are expecting this. They're looking forward to it. You know, even though Pierce County and the last ST3 ballot said no to sound transit, um, people understand the reality of it's coming and it's getting closer and closer. And I think people are actually getting excited about it. That's good to hear. Um, I'll give you the last word, Councilmember Prince, before we have to wrap up this panel. Um, I, again, I uh, uh, the whole thing, um, as a recovering planning commissioner, I was a planning <laughs> commissioner before I was on the city council. This really gets me excited. I, it's something that really pumps me up. And I enjoy trying to plan for the future um, of our city. Excellent. This one final question just that, that prompts a question for me. How many of you entered sort of the public service or um, local government through service on a planning commission or a local body like uh, all of you? See, there we go. That's why we have such great elected officials to speak with about the planning process that we're moving forward with. So thank you all so much for your time today. Um, this was really um, inspiring to know that we have such great local leadership um, guiding these processes. Um, and it'll be kind of an exciting next couple of years as these plans take shape. So thanks again. Um, I'll turn it back over to Maggie. Great. Thank you so much, Ben. And thank you to all of our presenters and our panelists today. Very inspiring, I hope, as uh, the comprehensive plan process is ongoing for many jurisdictions or just starting off or kicking off, as we talked about. Um, we have a few poll questions as we close out today's event. So Heather, if you could launch those for us. And then just as a reminder, we have all of our Passport events recorded and on our YouTube channel. So uh, you can go there if you want to see any of those more specific topics. This one will be posted soon. And after today's event, I'll send out the recording to everyone as well as all of the presentations. We've also had some requests for the questions that didn't get answered today. So we'll work through those and answer them too. Uh, so as we kind of close out today, we're wondering how you're feeling about the workshop. I know there were a lot, there's a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, we weren't able to get in depth on many things. Um, but just great to hear some feedback. And if you have any um, other feedback you want to share with us, you can put it in there or you can email our plan review at psrc.org. As I mentioned, we'll be holding an event in June specific to legislative changes, what that means for the current comprehensive plan, as well as what we think would be helpful to consider in the plan updates now, even if they're not requirements until later. Um, and you will receive information from us on how to stay in the loop with PSRC and Commerce on the plan review process. So as I mentioned earlier, there will be a Title VI survey that pops up when the meeting ends. If you could just fill that out, it's anonymous um, and you it will help us kind of have some more information on the demographics of people who attend our various events at PSRC. So thank you so much.